Scripture reading today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. I'm reading from the uh, New American Standard. Oh, good morning, Church. Uh, good morning, Church. <laughs> <clears throat> Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable. But I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows. <clears throat> such a man was caught up to the third heaven, and I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For if I do wish to boast, I shall not be foolish, for I shall be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so that no one may credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. And because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for the power is perfected in weakness. Amen. The second gift listed in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, as we're thinking about spiritual gifts this, this summer, the second gift is prophets. It says, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, Second, prophets. Many associate the gift of prophecy with dreams and visions. There's a reason for that. One of the uh, early terms used to speak of prophets was seers. God spoke to them and he showed them things. Sometimes the vision would come during their sleep and sometimes it would come when they were awake. I've never once had a vision or a dream from God. Not once. Now some might look askance at me and consider me among the, the ungifted. I one time heard God speak. It was clear as a bell but I'll not tell you what he said. We looked at uh, Paul's defense of his apostleship in 2 Corinthians chapters 10 to 12. After Paul left town, other men rose to positions of leadership in the church who passed themselves off as apostles and wanted the church to follow them instead of adhering to what they'd been taught by Paul. In his defense in these three chapters, Paul went on to speak, and it starts in chapter 10 and goes through chapter 12, but Paul went on to speak of visions and revelations of the Lord. But the context for his words, you see, was that he was comparing himself to these false apostles. Look at chapter 11, verse 18. Since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. Or look at the end of verse 21. But in, what, when, in whatever respect anyone is bold, I speak in foolishness, I'm just as bold myself. 
Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I am more so. Paul compared himself to these that in verse 13 he called deceitful workers who disguised themselves as apostles of Christ. Did they boast of visions? Paul could talk to them about visions and revelations. So that's where he went at the start of chapter 12. That he didn't want to go there is evident by what he said in verse 1. Boasting is necessary, though it's not profitable, he wrote. But I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Paul, too, could boast about visions that he had had. But he didn't think that it would serve any good purpose. Why share it? So he could make a good showing in the flesh? It's interesting how much of Paul's discussion in these three chapters has to do with the flesh. As he said in, in 11, chapter 11, verse 18, since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. Paul, uh, in Philippians 3, he speaks in the same vein when he writes in verses 2 to 4. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else, else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, Paul wrote. This whole exercise that Paul was being forced into and having to defend himself was from his detractors was about human comparisons. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and uh, verse 12. Or 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry. He's, he says, For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. These false apostles, they measured themselves by themselves and by comparing themselves to one another. It was an exercise in the flesh and it was foolishness. Look at verse 18 of chapter 10. For it's not he who commends himself that is approved, but whom the Lord commends. And verse 17, but he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. You see, while these guys were boasting about dreams and visions that they had had, Paul's only boast was in the Lord Christ. And apart from the necessity of having feeling like he had to offer a defense of his ministry, we might never have known about the visions he described in chapter 12, verses 1 to 9 of our text. So look at those. Look at our text there. It's the context that tells us that Paul is speaking of himself in verses 2 to 4 when he says, you know, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or I do not know or out of the body, I do not know. Why did Paul shift to speaking about himself in the third person and not just say that he had been caught up into the third heaven? I think it's because he didn't want to draw attention to himself, as these others did in relating their visions. You see, for Paul, it was all about Jesus and giving the glory to him. How could he even share such an experience and not draw attention to himself? He couldn't. So he found it better not to tell it and to tell of numerous other revelations he had had. Look at verse 7. Because of, the, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, he wrote. Revelations in, in the plural. We will never know what most of them were. Now, for someone running a circus show like Simon the Great, these revelations would have been front and center. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.2 2, that when he came to town, he determined to know nothing among them except Christ and him crucified. Paul wanted all the attention to be where it belonged on the gospel of Christ. The real power was in that message. 
Simon saw that for himself in Acts 8, when Philip brought the gospel message to Samaria. Simon couldn't believe what he saw. Now it's true that when, that when uh, Philip came to Samaria, he performed signs. Acts 8 verse 6 says the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they saw, as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. But you see, verse 6 comes after verse 5, which says Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. You see, this was no stage show like, uh, like, like Simon had going. This was about making known the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, look at, look at uh, verses 7 and 8 of Acts 8. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting out with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in the city. The acts of power that Philip performed were called signs in verse 6, because that's exactly what they were. They pointed to the truth of the message Philip was sharing with them. In other words, they were signs that pointed people to Jesus. Paul performed miracles too, didn't he? Acts chapter 19, verses 11 and 12 says this, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. It is extraordinary, is it not? That this one, this one, would be saying in, 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 in 2 Corinthians 12 that he must have appeared weak in comparison. In comparison to these flashy so-called apostles who bullied the flock. You know, if they, want, if they thought Paul was weak and wanted to get in a, into a contest with him, Paul was up to that. He wrote in, he wrote in 1 Corinthians 4, 19 and 20, but I'll come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. Paul's power lay in his authority. He had no power of his own. That's why Acts 19.11 says that God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. And then if we were to keep reading Acts 19, it, it, tell, it goes on to tell of some who attempted to cast out demons in the name of Jesus, but who ended up getting jumped by the demon-possessed guy that they were trying to help. And the reason, of course, is that they were acting on their own authority. Not, you know, they, they weren't acting on Jesus' authority. They, they were paying lip service to him, to his name, as did Paul's detractors in Corinth. They were using Jesus' name for their own purposes. You see, when evaluating spiritual gifts and the, claim, the claims of those who boast of dreams and revelations, we must always ask, whose purpose does this serve? Paul obviously didn't want our faith to be based on such personal experiences. You see, while we are intensely interested in the vision Paul related in chapter 12 about this one being caught up to the third heaven, Paul, Paul it seems, didn't think there was any good purpose in talking about it. The problem, of course, with placing our faith in such experiences is that they are subjective and unverifiable. Only the person who has such a dream or experience knows the context, and there is of necessity some interpretation involved. Was it from God? And what does it mean? Now that does not mean that all such experiences should be discounted or ignored, not at all. But what we must not do is place these experiences on par or level with Scripture. We interpret our experience in light of Scripture and not the other way around. Do you hear me on that? Many interpret Scripture, you see, through the skewed lens of experience, through the, through the skewed lens of things that so-called prophets have claimed to see. That's how we got the Mormons. Who carry, who carry a Bible and profess faith in it, 
But it seems the faith they have is very different. Why? It's because they interpret the Bible through the teachings of Joseph Smith, who they believe was directed by an angel to some buried golden plates. Smith said he returned the plates, or he translated the plates into what is now called the Book of Mormon, and then returned them to the angel. But his claims are entirely unverifiable. Indeed, there's no historical or archeological evidence to support the existence of the people or of the events in the Book of Mormon. The Bible, on the other hand, is about real people and real historical events. In fact, if you wanna know the truth, the reason that people have, so many people have a problem with the Bible is because it's, it's, it's so real. And because it's so real, it's so ugly. The Enlightenment or the Age of Reason went hand in hand with the spread of Christianity because biblical faith is reasonable and it holds up to scrutiny. We are not recommending that people believe and base their lives on things that aren't verifiable. Indeed, I'm advising against that this morning. Now, that being said, there's still room for faith. One cannot escape the conclusion that God intentionally ordered things in such a way as to provide abundant evidence, and yet not so much that faith isn't still required. For it is. And faith is the very thing that delights him. We believe that God spoke to Abraham. Do you believe that? I do. Now, no one, no one else heard what God said to him. They didn't hear God say to him, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land, which I will show you and I'll make you a great nation and I will bless you. Not even his wife, Sarah, got to hear that. And you can imagine how it must have strained credulity when her husband came home and told her what had happened and said they were gonna to have to move. I mean, how, how did he even know that it was God that spoke to him? I wasn't there, I can't say. Well, one might ask how that's any different from, for, for those who place their faith in Joseph Smith's claims, because they're just that, claims, right? Abraham claimed that God spoke to him. Haven't countless mentally ill people done the same? How are we to know if God did or didn't? And the answer is that we have to consider the claim in context. We evaluate what we cannot verify by what we can. Now that God can speak to a person, any person he chooses is undeniable. Whether he really spoke to them, is another matter. Sometimes people will stand up in this group and tell of things that God told or showed them. There's, now there's obviously an element of interpretation that goes into such a conclusion, right? We listen with interest and end up having to judge for ourselves how much weight to give to their words. Well, I hope that I can speak for all of us in saying that if God does speak to one of us or shows one of us something, then I'm interested in hearing it and knowing what it is. For as it says in Psalm 139, 17, precious are his thoughts to me. We believe that God spoke to Abraham because of everything that happened afterwards and the trail of evidence that was left behind. When you look at the evidence, it would be far, far harder to believe that God didn't speak to Abraham than that he did. It's the same with Jesus. We can't verify his claim that, that he's the son of God and came down from heaven, but we've come to believe it. Why? Because the weight of evidence drives us to that conclusion. There's no other reasonable way to account for the phenomenon of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said repeatedly that his words were not his own and that he was simply doing the bidding of those who sent him. But how do we know that? Here's how. 
Jesus said, the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Jesus told, told people that if they couldn't bring themselves to believe his words, that they should believe because of the works he was doing. Works which testified to the truth of his words. God is not asking us to check our reason at the door and just take his word for it. Now, he's absolutely asking us to believe his word, but that in the context of his works, of all that he's done and continues to do. We can't verify the, the Bible's first and foundational claim in Genesis 1-1, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We can't verify that. And you know, if the Bible stopped there, I don't know that any, any of us would be believing it. But the Bible doesn't stop there, does it? We come to Genesis 1-1 and we evaluate it as part of a mountain of evidence left to us in the whole of Scripture. Prophecy in the broadest sense is a word from God. It's used in this sense in Revelation 19.10 when it says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit or intent of prophecy. Or when it says in 2 Peter 1.20 that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. All scripture is God-breathed. And that means that, that although it was spoken and written down by men, we receive it the same way that Jesus did, as the very word of God. When 2 Peter 1.21 says that no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, it's not just talking about those portions of scripture that, that foretell the future. It's talking about all of scripture. Jesus, he claimed to speak for God. And most everybody received his teachings as such. But not all. There were those who refused to accept that he was a true prophet of God, and they contested his words. But they were fighting against God, weren't they? The last thing I, wanted, I want people saying about me is that I oppose God's word. In the next couple of weeks, we'll give some thought, some attention to this gift of uh, prophecy discussed by Paul. I, I, I'm starting out this morning by addressing dreams and revelation because they're related, but they're, they're certainly not the same as prophecy. This morning, what I want to point out is, is that what makes prophecy prophecy is that it originates from God. And I also want to point out that a lot of stuff that gets attributed to God isn't really from him. As we evaluate the claims that God has said something to someone or shown them something, we must assess the claim, the context, and the motive. To what purpose is this thing? By the time it gets to us through the, through the filter of, of a person's interpretation, there's just a lot of room to get, the, to get something wrong, isn't there? Scripture, on the other hand, as it says in, in 2 Peter 1.20, is never a matter of private interpretation. And that's because although there, there was a human element, Scripture has God for its author, and we know that we can trust it. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 13, there's a strange and terrible story of which we read a part earlier in the service. God sent a man of God to Bethel to prophesy against the king while calling him out for his evil doing. God had told this unnamed prophet not to eat bread or drink water, but to come straight back after he had done his errand. But there was an old prophet in Bethel who heard of the incident and who very much wanted to meet this man who had performed such a noteworthy miracle. So he runs him down and he begs the man of God to come home with him and receive his hospitality. And when the prophet told them that God had forbidden him to eat, to eat or drink until he'd returned, the old man said that he too was a prophet and that an angel had spoken to him and commanded him to bring the man back for a meal. Now, I don't know, the way I read it, scripture doesn't seem to me to, to, to lead me to believe that this old man wasn't truly a prophet in his own right. 
I'm going to say he probably was. Nevertheless, on this occasion, he lied. And you know what? You know, uh, I, I also get the impression of reading the story that I don't really think he meant any harm by it. He just wanted to bring, you know, but he, he made up this bit about God telling him to bring him back for a meal. That you, he didn't, if he didn't mean any harm, harm came by it. And if you know the rest of the story, it cost the man of God his life. You see, we're a mixed bag of motives, all of us. Jeremiah 17, 9, it truly says that our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked, and it asks, who can know them? And the answer, of course, is no one. We think we do things for one reason. When truth be known, sometimes we're doing them for another. We can scarcely understand our own hearts, let alone our night visions. Sometimes people pass things off as the word of God, and they mean well. They do. But their word is misguided, perhaps even harmful. Now, I, I'm convinced Isaiah was truly speaking for God when he said to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. We're followers of Jesus, right? What did our master teach us? He said that not the teensiest pinstroke of the law would fail, but that it would all be fulfilled. Oh, but we're bored with that. We don't, you know, we, we, you know we'll consider next week. We, we'd rather hear something new, you know. Uh, we, we think pe people, won't, people won't listen to that. Oh, but if someone returned from the dead and spoke to them, then they believe. People believe if they saw something spectacular. And what did, what did our master say? He said that if they won't hear Moses and the prophets, they wouldn't even believe if someone came back to them from the dead. Maybe that's why Jesus only appeared to believers after his resurrection. He didn't try to make any believers out of unbelievers by showing himself to them. Paul knew a man who was caught up to the third heaven. The very place that Jesus came to us from. Now, do you think that Jesus couldn't have boasted about the things that he had seen and left behind in heaven? Why do you think, why didn't he go into detail about them? And for me, the inescapable conclusion is that he believed it would, it would serve no good purpose. He did not come to tickle our fancy, but to bring us a word from God, a word to be obeyed. Now, we may not all come down at the same place on our understanding of prophecy. And I think that'll be okay as long as we are all earnestly trying to obey the word of God. Jesus said in John 17, if anyone's willing to do his will, he'll know of the teaching. Whether it's from God or whether I speak from myself. I'm holding on to that. How about you? In closing, let us hear the next words out of Jesus' mouth in John 17, John 7, 18. Jesus said, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who's seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. I'm placing my faith. If I gotta trust somebody, I'm placing my faith in the one who isn't seeking his own glory, but God's. And that's what we have in Jesus. Now there are, there are others too that I trust and I listen to, and sometimes God speaks to me through them and their experiences, but I take their word for what it's worth because they too are fallible, sinful flesh. Like the old man in 1 Kings 13, they are above line. One is, 
who we can trust all the time. And his word is perfectly reflected in this book, the Bible. In listening to it, we listen to our master. And it's his voice we're listening for. Right? I hope so. Jesus said, uh, He knows his sheep. And if they hear his voice, and as we consider uh, this whole thing about uh, what, uh, what, uh, what I hope is that we are seeking God, we want to do his will, we're listening for his voice in order to respond and obey to it. If we do that, if anyone's willing to do his will, and that, that's what that's the desire of their heart. There's going to be these different voices, and 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 sometimes we're not going to know what to think or who to listen to or what to is that is is that for real? Uh, let us seek him, and uh, he will guide us, and let us hold on to the sure anchor of his revealed word. Let's pray. Lord, do speak to us. That's what that's a desire of all of our hearts. I know that uh, for many here among us, I know that their hearts ache for an experience with you to be able to say like they've heard others do that you spoke to them or that you showed them something. Lord, you have spoken, and it's my prayer that you help each one to know that. Each one to recognize. And Lord, our, our, our position is, Paul learned, when, when he said if he, if he was going to boast, it would be in his weakness. Lord, if he was going to boast, it, it was going to be in the fact that he, that, that, that he was just a needy, dependent sinner who had a great God and Savior. Lord, bring us to the place where we can truly rejoice, not in, in ourselves, Lord, but in you. And uh, we pray that you teach us, Jesus, again, once again. We say this often at the end of a message, but Lord, we, we just center ourselves again on that. We are disciples. You are the teacher. Help us to understand what these things are. Patiently keep working with us. And uh, help us to recognize your voice, we pray. Amen. Let's stand.
Thank you.